Caleb's story number two. Mothers. My two little granddaughters stared up at me, wide-eyed. Gee, Grandpa, Patty said, that, that must have been really cold. She shivered, then pouted her bottom lip and looked at me with sad eyes. But those poor bunnies. And Caleb, added Katie, was it Daddy who pushed him so hard under the stove and, and broke off his tail? Poor Caleb. Both girls kneeled down and started stroking my old dog. But when they tried to touch his tail, Caleb tucked in the stub and sat up on his haunches. Just as Caleb sat up, the screen door slammed, and Emmeline stepped down the house steps, packing a big tray that held a plate of still steaming oatmeal cookies and three tall, cold glasses of chocolate milk, and even a bowl of white milk for Caleb. Grandma! Grandma! the girls yelled as Caleb and them jumped up and run to meet her. Grandpa told us about that really cold winter a winter of 49, said Katie, when when you got all frozen and, and, and Caleb, he broke his tail, and, and when Grandpa spit it on those poor bunnies, added Patty. Well, now, before I could duck my head, Emmeline caught my eye, and I, I knew darn well there was a lecture on the way. She set the tray down and, and started explaining all about exaggerating to the twins, and and the difference between real life and tall tales. I knew darn well she was really aiming the message at me. It seems like uh, older female creatures just don't take kindly to a, to a fellow stretch in the truth, even if it is just, just a touch. Once Emmeline had left us free to enjoy our snack, I decided I'd I'd maybe change my tune. I'd I tell them girls some true to life stories. Ones ones about things that really did happen to me and mine out when we were growing up out in Snake Valley. I started off by showing the girls a picture from our photo album, a picture of a couple of mothers from my early days. The picture showed my mother holding my baby brother Ferris out in front of the big hip roof barn at our old home place. The other mother was peering around the corner of the barn. It was our red and white Ayrshire milk cow, Daisy. When I was a youngster, me and Daisy had a steady date beside the milk and stool at about six o'clock every morning and six o'clock every night. To begin with, ours was one of those truly mutually benefiting relationships. At each milking, Daisy got a gallon of chop, a, a fork full of green hay, and the, the relief of my deflating her tight udder. Me? I had a warm spot in her flank to rest my forehead and dream against, and, and the opportunity to flex strengthen my hands, filling the galvanized steel bucket fresh milk. I can still hear those first thick white squirts, spink splunking into the pail's empty bottom. Every morning and night, Daisy would be standing at the cow pasture gate, waiting to be let in. When I got close, she'd move to me soft and low, like I was her very own calf. And after I started milking, Daisy would swing her head back to nuzzle my shoulder with a, a sweat damp nose that maybe had a crumble or two a chop on it. My dog Caleb appreciated Daisy too. Since she knew Caleb was my dog, Daisy didn't take a run at him like the other cows did, and, and she'd even let him belly up close behind her, where I could aim long, milky streams into his open mouth. I got the first hint of our relationship going sour. The summer's morning, Daisy squirmed and switched her tail, and instead of enjoying a warm drink, Caleb ended up spluttering and sneezing and 
pawing a milk mustache off his muzzle. I'd been milking Daisy morning and night for almost a year, and that was the first time she'd ever got fussy. If the other cows were upset about something, they'd flick their long stringy tails in my face, sometimes even kick over the pail or, or splunk a foot into it. But Daisy had never made a wrong move up until that morning. I was surprised and, and hurt, so I told Pa. He came over to the barn, took a look at Daisy, and informed Caleb and me that our big-bellied milk cow would soon be birthing a calf. Well, now, I was just about as pleased and excited as an eight-year-old sort of first-time daddy could be. I told Pa that Caleb and me would head right on over to the barn and bed a stall for Daisy. I said we'd be happy to haul feed and water to her and clean her stall twice a day if she could just stay in the barn until her time came. But Pa, he said no. Said it was summertime and since this wasn't Daisy's first calf, she'd be better off birth and outside in the cow pasture. Caleb and me kept pestering though until Pa finally compromised. He said that Daisy usually wandered to the far end of the pasture the day before she calved, and when Caleb and me saw her down there by herself, he'd, he'd help us bring her in. As soon as we got the okay from Pa, my dog and me hurried over to the barn. Our Belgian stud had the biggest and best stock fox stall in the barn, but he was still running out in the Buffalo Hills with the mares, so Caleb and me commandeered the, the stud stall for Daisy. I don't suppose there's ever been a milk cow that's had a nicer spot prepared for her birthing. On our trips back and forth from the straw pile, I had the wheelbarrow heaped so high that I couldn't even see over the yellow bedding. Caleb had to bark directions ahead of me, as so I weaved and wobbled a dozen wheelbarrow loads over to the barn. We fluffed the straw up so it was nice, level, two feet deep and finished off by portioning three gallons of chop into Daisy's feed bucket and forking her manger full of the freshest, greenest hay in the loft. In my mind, I could see Daisy promenade into that stall like the great British queen that she was. A fellow wouldn't be able to see her legs or feet, not even her royal udder for the deep bedding. Her beauteous form would float over the clean yellow straw right across to the full manger where Daisy could munch enough feed to fill up all four of her stomachs at once. For the next couple days, before and after school, I kept an eagle eye on the pasture, even though Pa had said he didn't think Daisy would pop for a while yet. They say a watched pot won't boil. Well... The same thing goes for cattle. A watched cow won't pop, either. By the weekend, Daisy was still hanging out with the other milk cows. Saturday morning, Caleb and me were supposed to be weeding and thin in the garden. Caleb was a bit careless as to what he dug and what he left, but he did work fast. Myself, I, I didn't get much done. I I'd straighten up to check Daisy, then bend down to pull one more weed and straighten up again, then, then down and up and down and up and down and up and down. It's lucky I was young. If, if I tried bending like that now, I'd probably kink and break into two pieces like a chunk of rusty fence wire. About mid-afternoon, Daisy, by herself, ambled over against the far fence, and she lay down. Well... As soon as her big belly touched the ground, I was up and running. Pa was rod weeding a summer fall a field south of the house. In no time at all, Caleb and me had dusted out into the field to tell him all about Daisy. Pa wooed his outfit and gave the horses a breather while, while he heard me out. After I finished my spiel... Pa was surprisingly reluctant to help us retrieve Daisy. He said he figured the milk cow would wait until he brought his outfit in for supper. Just before clucking the horses on their way, Pa made me and Caleb promise to stay away from Daisy. Well, 
There was nothing to do but shove my hands in my pockets and shuffle back to the garden, kick and dirt lumps on the way. Caleb, he ran ahead and made a quick, heavy cull of a half row of carrots before he tuckered out. When I arrived, my dog was lying with his muzzle resting on top of a potato hill, staring towards the cow pasture. I started weeding again. All the time I worked, my mind dwelled on man's inhumanity towards milk cows, and about bulls' inhumanity towards milk cows, too. Pa had said that McCurdy's highland bull was the calf's father. As I tore at each weed, then straightened, then tore again, I, I couldn't help but wonder where in the blazes that character was, anyway. We hadn't seen hide nor hair of the gallivantin' red devil for, for almost a year now. He obviously wasn't fond of Daisy anymore, and he couldn't have been very concerned about his own flesh and blood, either. I figured that even if the beggar did straggle over for the birthing, I'd I'd probably spit in his red face, then sick Caleb on him. My dog and me could look after Daisy without help from that bull, without paw even, if he'd just let us. I was so steamed up that I scurried up and down those rows, and, and, and I finished the whole garden in less than an hour. When I was about to start a second cull, my, my apron-flapping mother ran outside and dragged me away. She said she'd been watching me from the kitchen window, and she had a better use for all my up-and-down routines. She led me over to the pump in front of the house, and I, I grabbed the pump handle. Once I got into a rhythm, my mother said she'd never seen such a gush of water. It only took a matter of minutes for me to fill the house cistern. Then I ran over to the barn, and I, and I filled the corral water trough to overflowing. My mother could see I still had more pumping in me, so she led me back to the house and hooked up the garden's irrigating hose. In no time at all, I'd pumped three or four inches of water onto the garden. Mother's face was just a beaming as she moved her gushing hose over to where it would irrigate the lawn grass around the house. Every time I moved, Caleb would shuffle over close to where I was pumping, sigh and flop down, his nose pointed towards the cow pasture. I'd glance over, see Daisy lying out there, and pump harder than ever. Not much before supper time, Pa came long striding into the yard behind his eight-horse hitch. Caleb and me were waiting for him. When, when Pa stopped the horses next to the fresh-filled water trough, I dodged in amongst dinner plate-sized hairy hooves and started unsnapping cross-checks. After Pa folded and hung the lines, he stripped off the bridles. When a horse was free, it would sip a drink of water, then lumber to the barn, duck into its stall, and start munching supper. Now, I'd watched lots, but I, I'd never unharnessed a horse before. I, I figured, though, that that day was a good time to learn. Old Brownie was as gentle as a big kitten, so I, I stepped into his stall. Both the haim strap and the belly band were within my, my reach, within the little fellow's reach. I unbuckled them both and, and started heaving and tugging and trying to pull that harness off Brownie's back. When everything started to slide, Pa yelled, Look out! But he was too late. I, I dropped butt first onto the straw, and the whole tangled mess tumbled on top of me. Luckily, the steel hames missed me, but I ended up sitting in the straw like a darn fool, with leather straps around my shoulders and the heavy tugs draped across my stomach. Brownie stopped munching long enough to give me a disgusted glance, then turned back to his dinner. After Pa rescued me, Caleb and me got relegated to watching and to pacing up and down the alley. When Pa finished, he saddled his riding horse, and I swung onto my pony bareback, and Caleb and me were about to head outside when Pa said that we'd best leave the dog behind. I tried to talk him out of it, but Pa insisted. He said a dog, even Caleb, would be upsetting to Daisy right now. Well, I lured my best friend inside a stall with that old favorite. Here, boy, here's a bone trick. 
then quickly latched both the top and bottom box stall doors behind him. Caleb wasn't the least bit happy about being locked in. He whined and scratched at the door as me and Pa rode out to the cow pasture. When we rode in close and made her get up, Daisy groaned her displeasure. On the way back to the barn, she took slow, mincing steps, with her swollen gut wobbling like a water balloon full to bursting, and everything floppy loose under her lifted tail. Daisy didn't seem too keen on coming in. She angled this way and that way and zigged and zagged across the pasture, but we finally maneuvered her through the gate and into the yard. Caleb was still barking and whining and door scratching. He was making such a racket that we had trouble persuading Daisy to step into the barn. Pa finally told me to run inside and get that noisome hound out of the way. I dragged Caleb by the scruff of his neck out the back door while Pa herded Daisy in through the front. My dog and me didn't even get to see our Dairy Queen float into her stall. Pa wouldn't let us visit Daisy after she was inside either. He said our milk cow was real close to Cavan and she'd been upset enough already by Caleb serenading. He said we could see her in the morning when, she, when we did our chores. Caleb... He whimpered and presented Pa with the saddest, sorriest pair of dog eyes you ever did see. And I, I argued till I was blue in the face, but Pa wouldn't give in. He wouldn't let us have even the teensiest look in at Daisy. You can bet Caleb and me didn't eat hardly anything for supper and didn't sleep much that night either. It felt like Christmas Eve or, or the day before my birthday. Caleb and me were both wide-eyed at 4.30 in the morning. By 5 o'clock, I knew we weren't going to get any more shut-eye, so I pulled on my clothes and we sneaked down the stairs. I grabbed the milk pails, eased the screen door open, went out, then eased it shut, and Caleb and me hurried over to the barn. Before I'd even slid the door open, the horses heard us and nickered. I shushed them quiet and promised that we would feed them right after we looked in on Daisy. Caleb and me ran down the alley to the end of the barn. The stud stall was built with extra thick planks, and to keep him from reaching out and biting other horses, there were iron prison bars sunk into the high-set window. The barred window next to the door was too high for me to peek over, so I set a three-legged milking stool where I could stand on it. Caleb tried to climb up on the stool before me, but I, I shoved him off. Being human should count for something, and I figured getting the first look at Daisy was my privilege. Even with the extra height of the stool, I couldn't much more than stick my nose over the lip of the sill, but by straining on tippy-toes, I, I could see Daisy's head and the top half of her back where she lay below the window. When I spoke, Daisy stared up at me. Then she swung her head around and down to nuzzle something lying beside her. She moved soft and low, like she used to moo at me. I knew that Daisy must have calved, so I, I grabbed hold of the bars and, and lifted myself up higher. And I could see it. The calf's sleeping head was curled into its flank. Its dark red hair was licked clean. That calf was a real beauty except for the fact it favored McCurdy's Highland Bull. I ignored the uh, unfortunate resemblance and cooed and talked baby talk and told Daisy what a wonderful mama she was, but she just stared up at me like I was bonkers or something. Meanwhile, Caleb was going nuts below me. That crazy dog whined and jumped and clawed the back of my legs. He even knocked the stool over and I had to ease my way down, then dropped the last couple inches to the to the alley floor. I reset the stool and helped Caleb plant his hind legs on it, but even hopping up on tippy claws, my dog couldn't nudge his nose over the window sill. Caleb whined and complained till I lifted him up so he could look in. He pushed his nose through the bars and started simpering and whimpering at Daisy and her calf in the most disgusting fashion. I was embarrassed myself, and darn glad there were no other dogs around to hear whatever canine gibberish Caleb was spouting. Back then, my dog was almost as heavy as me. 
I couldn't hold him up for more than a minute or so. When I had to set him down, Caleb gave me a sidelong pout, sniffed and slunk over to an open stall, and he laid down. After pulling myself up by the bars for a second look, I, I decided I'd like to touch Daisy's calf. I, I dropped back down, unlatched the door, and stepped inside. Daisy's back end was towards me. I bent down and gave her a comforting scratch on the hip. Then, with my shoulders rubbing the rough plank wall, I, I edged along, talking slow and soft all the time until, until I was right across from Daisy's head. As I stroked behind her floppy ears, Daisy stiffened and scowled at me. She wouldn't bow her head to let me scratch the chaff out of the dust-collecting hollow behind her pole. She used to love to have me do that. I lowered my hand to touch the sleeping calf, and Daisy's cow eyes narrowed. She watched my every move. As I touched the calf, I was newly amazed at how fine-haired and silky soft a newborn calf's hair felt. My fingers were just completing a second slow stroke when something creaked, creaked. It was the box stall door. It creaked further open, and this time Daisy noticed. She swung her head back and watched as Caleb squeezed his nose, his ears, and finally his shoulders through the widening crack. Daisy's hind end rose like a puppeteer had jerked her strings. Then her front legs pushed up. I was amazed as our meek, mild milk cow spun around, bawled, and made a lowered head rush for the door. Caleb stood staring. He barely jumped out of the way when Daisy rammed the door wide open with her head. But the most surprised of all was Daisy's bug-eyed calf. Poor little beggar leapt up, echoed his mum's beller, and started butting me, bellering, Ma! Ma! with every butt. When Daisy swung her heavy head around, glared at me, I, I knew I'd best get the heck out of there, and quick. But Daisy stood blocking the doorway. All I could think to do was to leap up and grab hold of the window's bars, which I did, without the aid of the three-legged stool. My boots scrabbled up the wall, and I crawled onto the window ledge. Daisy stood below, watching to make sure I didn't set foot in the box stall. The very stall Caleb and me had specially prepared for her. Sitting scrunched on that narrow sill and looking out at the rest of the barn through the bars, I, I felt like Snake Valley's version of the Birdman of Alcatraz. For a moment, Caleb stood silhouetted in the open door at the other end of the barn. I cussed him. A couple minutes after I yelled at him, I, I heard Caleb barking over at the house. Pretty soon, Pa stepped through the barn door. He looked worried as he, as he hurried down the alley. He was still shrugging his braces over his shoulders as he buttoned up his trousers. After checking the stall, though, and, and finding both us youngsters safe, Pa couldn't help but chuckle. I can't say as I saw much humor in the situation, at least not until after Pa stepped inside and packed me on his shoulders past Daisy and out of the stall. That fickle-hearted mother got to keep her calf for three or four days. Then Pa took it away for us kids to bottle feed, and I started milking Daisy again. For the first couple days, she shifted from foot to foot and threatened to kick the pail and kept swatting her tail in my face, but within a week, Daisy had stopped her fussing. By the end of August, she was low bellering to me at the gate, and Caleb was sipping squirted milk again.